Hey everyone again, Sarah Lucille, Director of Student Services here at the Institute for the Psychology of Eating. And we are live again today with Peter Craig, who will be sharing more about his work in the world in um, as a graduate, but also as someone in um, the counseling space and how he has taken his training in eating psychology and mind body nutrition into his own practice in a way that um, I think a lot of other counselors would appreciate hearing about. So if you are a counselor or um, your work is in mental health, I think this would be a really great interview for you. And also if you're in the comments, let us know where you're tuning in from and post any questions and I will read them a loud um, when I find a convenient way to do that. So um, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why don't you tell us more about who you are and what you do in the world? Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me. And hey, all the IPE community, I, I love you guys. Um, it's great to be chatting with you. Um, I did the training in 2015, became a certified coach in uh, eating psychology. And I was also going back to school in psychology, getting a master's in counseling. And when I looked at the master's in counseling curriculum, there's zero information on uh, nutrition and physical health. And it was kind of disappointing to me to see that. And I think that's probably common for most mental health curriculum, even though more and more science is showing that the mind body connection, the gut brain connection is a very important part of our mood and health and so on. So, um, I've been passionate about health and wellness for my whole life. And, um, one of my mentors told me about Mark David and the program. And when I looked at it compared to the other nutrition programs I was looking at, it was just way more meaningful because it's getting to the root in my mind as a, as a counselor, we're always trying to get to the root, which is not just about changing behavior, but about looking at what drives behavior, our emotions and deepest core needs, you know, existential, even spiritual. And so it's really exciting to get to work with clients and explore some of their deeper drives around who they are as a person and who, how they feel about their body and how they feel as an eater. And so happy to talk more about that. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. And when you say you enrolled in the training um, and saw that there was a need in the counseling space to be able to Feel, feel, I think, equipped to have these conversations, um, which I completely understand. And I also am curious, was it coming up for you in your work with others? Um, or was it something that you were passionate about that you wanted to create a practice around? Um, and how does it come up for you now in your work? In other words, are people coming to you more for health or are they coming for counseling services? And this is a skill set that you bring to the table. Yeah. So first question, I think, is um, I was more interested for my own well-being and as becoming a coach. So actually just becoming a certified coach was a, a big appeal of the program. I felt very inspired by Mark David from what I read um, and Institute and Emily Rosen, of course. And um, as, as a man, in specifically, basically just eat whatever, don't care about your body, you know, eat as fast as you can. Um, and that just, I wanted to revisit those ideas that I probably internalized growing up in a culture that um, doesn't have a lot of awareness, especially for men, I think maybe around eating. And so I got to learn about my own eating behaviors in a way that really was very helpful, especially, I think I had some binge eating behaviors, which I still have occasionally, I suppose, um, of, you know, especially like ice cream eating, food equals gaining more weight, more muscle, whatever, and kind of a little bit out of control with that sometimes. And just the, counsel, the coaching program really brought more awareness to those behaviors. And I have been able to make healthier choices from doing the program and realizing how those behaviors and habits were internalized and playing out. So that was really helpful. Um, and then your second question, see if I can remember what it was. Um, I am a general counselor. I'm a licensed professional counselor, LPC. I'm still in my intern phase getting my hours. So I'm not specifically working with eating disorders, which is requires in my mind actually a lot of specialization for. Um, so I do think there's a, a note of caution for coaches who are dealing with people who have significant mental health issues along with um, wanting to change their diet. But 
I love working with eating psychology principles and I bring it in pretty regular because a lot of people I see for anxiety, depression, relationship issues tend to have a relationship with their body or issues around health and nutrition that are really important to them and they want to work on. So I feel really equipped with the training as a coach, the training I got to be a coach, and then also the information around mind, body, nutrition, and eating psychology principles to help people feel more empowered with their relationships and improve their behavior around those eating behaviors. Got it. I love the point that you keep bringing up around um, getting to be a coach and you're mm -hmm. a counselor. And so you probably yeah. have a better sense of than um, even myself on the difference between the two. And if someone were to ask, you know, what would you say distinguishes coaching when you step into coaching versus counseling? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because I don't want to overspiel on this, but you know, the counseling field, I really have a lot of respect for it because it really is, you get a master's degree, you do an internship, you do a lot of hours in training. Um, and with coaching, you can potentially get a coaching certification easier in some senses. Um, even though there is the International Coaching Federation and a lot of training that coaches do, uh, professional coaches. Um, I love being able to do both because to me, counseling, I explain to clients often how I see the treatment plan with counseling is that we work on past, present, and future. So the past is more about mining childhood and what are the internalized beliefs and major events that play out in your present and projecting to the future. Present moment is more like what's happening now, more somatic, what's going on in your body, um, what are you feeling emotionally, and then future, which is let's set some goals, what's your vision for your life. And I think counseling focuses more on the past and the present often, and coaching is more oriented towards the present and the future. So it's not, let's say, like, let's talk about your childhood in coaching. I mean, that's possible, but it's really more of an orientation towards the future. You let's set some goals, what are barriers to the goals, how can we move forward. So I think that's a major distinction between counseling and coaching. Um, and in a way, counseling training gives you the skills to mine the past in a way that can be helpful and sensitive when people have maybe trauma or really unresolved emotional pain that it takes some extra skill around holding space for people. Um, so to me, a lot of people want to improve their lives, but counseling seems maybe stigmatized or just too, like, I don't have something wrong. I just want to improve my life. So I think coaching appeals to a lot of people in that it's, Hey, I want to be proactive in improving my relationships, improving my body image, improving my health and nutrition. So I'd love to work with the coach. Mm, got it. What comes up the most for you? Does it feel more like counseling sets the precedent for coaching or do you feel more approached for coaching? Um, or does it, is it, is there really no comparison? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I joined a counseling practice. I'm in private practice with my mentor, John Howard, Austin Professional Counseling, and he's now a nationally recognized couples therapist. And so it's really cool to get to learn from him and his mentors and um, do that. And I also have my own coaching practice, seeing clients for eating psychology. So most of my energy is going to building my counseling practice. And I also enjoy working with coaching clients separately and then a lot of the clients i work with in the counseling office i bring in like i said eating psychology principles and and do some coaching because i think a lot of people are actually frustrated with counseling when it's a bit too let's just talk about the past over and over again and then that nothing happens which actually i hear a lot of my office people say they just talk the whole time and their counselor's like uh-huh and then they leave and then they <laughs> feel like mm, I so um you know i I like to see it from both sides because I think coach, some coaches are really effective because they help people move forward in their lives. And one of the counseling theories is called solutions focused therapy, which to me is kind of a nice marriage of couching, uh, couching. <laughs> um, I like that. <laughs> not on the couch. I don't have a couch. Uh, I have comfortable chairs that, um, <laughs> um, so I, I feel like it's important as a counselor to be comfortable with more solutions focused, which, has some of the more coaching where you're really thinking about, well, what, what is your ideal? How do you want to move towards your ideal health and body image? And what are the obstacles in the way, which can be a different conversation than let's just talk about your childhood for 10 sessions. Mm. Yes. It's so, um, I've even after it's been like seven years for me in this, in this field of uh, work. And I came oh, from, 
Um, I was a teacher at an alternative school that was also a, a treatment center for oh, wow. um, youth that were coming, transitioning back into community. And, um, and so the teachers and the case managers and the counselors worked really closely together. And I um, still felt that like, there you we did they focused on cognitive behavioral therapy because it was like nine months to work with these kids and and still you felt that need for like what about um you know how long can we live in story and where does action take place mm -hmm. and i think um our coaches also have that question because we in eating psychology really value story your personal story your archetypes your mm -hmm. relationships and how that influences why you interact with food or body the way you might um and then where's where you begin to see the action is i think the the place where people as coaches are wondering like when do i jump in with guidance and advice. You know, like I've asked a series of questions, I've gained a lot of insight into my client. Do you have a sense of, or have you learned kind of the nuances between like holding space with curiosity? And then now is the time that I actually offer some tips and tools for this person to go out and try. Yeah, it's really an art. It's, it's a science in some way, but it's also really an art. And I think that's why Mark David's so inspiring is that he's really an artist that he's really, I'll, I'll explain it a little bit. Um, there's a, something called the therapeutic pyramid, which is in my mind, very enlightening about the counseling process where the foundation is presence. Then from there is the therapeutic alliance. And then from there skills and techniques. And when I learned that, I was like, Oh, okay, I'm in the right place. Cause to me, it really is about deepening our presence with people. And so when a client comes in, can you sit with them? Can you be with their emotions? Can you honor their wholeness? And that takes kind of honoring your wholeness in a way. The more you can, you know, holding space, the more you can really hold that for yourself, you can offer that to your clients. And so that's really a gift of the spiritual and psychological work of coach or counselors to be able to hold deeper space in a sense. So to me, that's the primary goal, even as a coach, is if, if your client can feel really seen by you and understood by you, then you'll probably, as a team, be able to do good work. And then that, so the next level is the therapeutic alliance. So in counseling research, the greatest indicator of positive change is the therapeutic alliance itself. So all these theories are trying to say, my theory is the best, now mine's the best, cognitive behavioral, experiential, whatever. And the research continues to show it's really the relationship that is the context of healing for most people. So I can imagine for coaching, that's similar, maybe a little bit different, but similar. And then on top of that, the skills and techniques. So to answer your question, I think first is just like Mark teaches is really being in a state of deep presence where you're willing to be with the client and be with their emotions and try to honor them and be curious about them. And from that really, work on being good at connecting and building a relationship. And that takes a lot of skill. And I think whether you're a counselor or a coach, if you're really naturally good at building relationships because you care about people and you're curious and you're excited to connect and you believe in people, that's really powerful. Um, and then so from that foundation of presence and then therapeutic alliance, you'll know when to move into more tips and goal setting and so on. So, that's kind of a long answer. And then to give you another answer, I would say um, it's an intuitive thing where first part of the session to me is really like background of relatedness. So in my sales training, it fits with counseling and coaching of, you know, you want some of the, you know, more casual conversation of directing, not as much pressure, like, hi, why are you here? You know, um, mm -hmm. the art of just getting to know someone a little bit and feeling connected and then moving into more deep work, which I would say, the first phase of counseling and even coaching is curiosity and where to start and why is this happening and what have you tried and how has it been? And that can take a lot of the session, even most of the session. And then after you do that, you can kind of weave some themes together and feel like you have a little bit of a treatment plan for the most meaningful work with them. Mm. Again, collaborating. And then so that can lead towards the end of a session, typically laying out a roadmap of maybe how you see things and what you think might be helpful and getting their collaboration on action steps moving forward. Yes. 
That was such a great answer. I love that. <laughs> and um, it, it made me think of you, the practitioner also, because I imagine you know what it's like to go from session to session. Um, and hopefully you have like time to have some of a moment to gather your yeah, thoughts for the next person. Yeah. But, um, and, and I, yes, I know that feeling of like transitioning from, cause you're really immersed into one person for, you know, an hour, hour and a half. And then yeah. you're going into the next person's story and you really want to maintain that level of presence and connection. And at the same time, I'm curious if you've, figured out for yourself the best way to also take care of yourself so that you can do that and you're not yeah. feeling that like common coach or counselor fatigue that can come up when you're always immersed in someone else's energy. Um, mm -hmm. well, is there anything that you've learned that does not work for you and then how have you learned to balance it out? Yeah, great question. <laughs> Compassion fatigue is a real thing, you know, with nurses or coaches or counselors um, your brain can only handle so much empathy, you know? Um, so self-care is kind of, it's almost a joke, but it's not a joke at all. Like self-care, you're doing your self-care today. I'm very committed to self-care and I've had the fortune of being supported by my family and friends a lot, building my career with, with this. And so I've just always made that a priority. And I get some people, if you're working full time and you're going to school and you have a lot of responsibilities with family, it's, it's hard to take time for yourself, but I would encourage everyone to really even just do one step, you know, coaching wise. One, what's one little goal you could set around blocking off an hour to go for a walk or do something nice for yourself? Or for me, there's kind of body, mind, spirit, self care. So physically, am I exercising? Am I eating well? Because, you know, as a counselor or a coach, you're on the move a lot. You know, if I eat out more, probably not getting as good as nutrients. So can I cook at home more, go to the grocery store, I get all my organic goodies? Um, and then mentally, you know, am I enjoying my work? Am I taking time to learn about things that are not work that stimulate my mind? You know, relationships. Do I have friends I can kind of vent with? Um, cause obviously my partner or family, you can do that, but you don't want to overburden them. You want to have ideally a friend network to distribute and offload some of our stress and also create emotional connection through sharing our struggle with people, you know, vulnerability. That's a big element we could talk all day about. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, spiritually, emotionally, are you taking time to, you know, practice spiritual practices or do your meditation or um, just nourish yourself in ways that feel best? So, um, yeah. Yes. I like the um, having a network. I feel like the yeah. alumni group for the, the graduates of the Institute was really special to me when I was a graduate for yeah. like, oh, I just had this session. I don't know if I did the right things or like yeah. really having a place to go was so important, um, which made me think of that, that initial period when you're coaching um, some of not just like the, the self-care needs you need to feel like present and balanced, but your own self-doubt you might have or, um, you know, Cons like fears, like, am I going to be good at this? Uh, did I say yeah. the right thing? Um, right. I, I think that's come up for every coach I've ever worked with or mentored. And I'm um, sure you can relate. I, I like, yeah. I still Absolutely. go there sometimes. Um, is there, I mean, what do you do in that case? I know you mentioned you have a mentor as well, which I'm curious yeah. about that relationship. Um, yeah. And what, what did you learn to do for yourself in those moments of self-doubt? Yeah, that's a really important question. I'm glad you're asking all the great questions. Um, really, it's important to build community and to be a part of the community, especially around, you know, being a coach or being a counselor. That's something I've really worked hard on. I was the social chair for my grad school and our counseling organization. So I'd throw happy hours, which is an excuse to have a beer, but really it's more of just getting to connect with people and de-stress, but also relate and share our struggle. Um, and then, yeah, with the mentor I mentioned, um, he's also a coach. And so getting, getting to share our struggles, you know, imposter syndrome is a big thing in counseling and coaching fields. We talked about, uh, I'm sure with Mark and as well as in counseling field that we're all growing as people. And Mark says, you know, you just have to be one step ahead of your client in a sense. 
And I agree with the spirit of that. And I, and I think also life asks us to really go in at our highest potential. So surrounding ourselves with people who believe in us, who see our highest potential, who challenge us to grow, um, that can be really supportive in the process of growing as a coach and growing as a person. And that's not always easy. There's kind of ups and downs. And so, yeah, having people in your community, having, I love the IP community. You know, I've, I've made a lot of long-term friends through the con- the conference and the training. And um, I should post more in the IP alum group, actually. Um, yeah. But I feel really supported by it. And I see people sharing their struggles and getting support. And that's so satisfying because we're all in it together. And I think that's something that Mark really shares the spirit of IPE is really we're all struggling with this. There's these cultural challenges and to be able to share that with each other is so helpful. And so I want to encourage everyone to really prioritize finding mentors, also just staying active in the community, whether that's IPE or otherwise, and getting the help you need. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) <laughs> um, I and yes, and to the mentorship relationship, or if you're reaching out to colleagues, um, I think that there's um, one thing that's come up because most of the people I work with individually are the um, the graduates, our newer coaches, and there's that fear of like, am I um, of having to present an image of mm-hmm. I have it together. And that right, qualifies right. me to work with people. And I think that's been debunked over and over and over again um, in that there's no expectation of perfection. And that's actually a way to create more mistrust. <laughs> like something's up with this person, like something yeah. that would be true. Yeah. I, I do think there's an edge to it because in a sense, we're an authority and you want to project authority as authentically as possible. Um And yet also be human. And so I think the best counselors and coaches are able to say like, hey, I've studied something and I have a lot to share. And I'm also in the trenches like everybody else trying to make better decisions and and do my best and make it work. And so there's a concept of disclosure, self-disclosure in counseling of, you know, what's therapeutically appropriate. Because in the past, counseling has said, like, you really shouldn't share anything about yourself. You're just kind of a blank slate for people to project onto and that really is changing. The more modern, postmodern counseling theories are saying, well, no, actually your humanity is a really important part of the relationship. And if you're too pulled back, you know, if people ask you like, oh, you know, tell me about, you know, do you have any brothers or sisters? And you're like, why are you asking? Me? It's like, <laughs> you know, that doesn't work for yeah. us. Especially millennials like myself, I guess. Um, it's like, <laughs> we're having a relationship here, you know, it's a conversation. And so I think, People should feel confident that a they you know with the training they have skills they have information that we can share with people that's important and valuable so period you have something to offer mm-hmm. also you're you learn from our own experiences like in couples therapy I've trained with Stan Tacken who's in my opinion probably the world's greatest couples therapist right now he has his own theory of of psychobiological approach to change that I think is very amazing that everyone should should check out if they're interested uh, but I was talking to him and he said you know you don't have to have a perfect relationship to be a couples therapist. You have to learn from your experiences and bring that to the table, but you have these skills and understandings that you can apply to anyone. And so that was really gave me confidence when, you know, I had a difficult relationship previously that I'm still kind of healing from. And so I think for all the coaches out there to realize like your struggle and your experience is part of the work to be able to share that. So that doesn't mean you have to overshare in terms of like self-disclosure. And so you think you need to be thinking about how much you share and why are you sharing it? What's the therapeutic benefit, but to bring your humanity and not feel shame or guilt about not having it all figured out or, you know, yeah, you have an eating behavior or whatever. Like, so what? Like that we're human. Yes. I appreciate that. I get that. Um, yeah. And I, I've, I've loved seeing the counseling field evolve around that too as a client and also um and and we got that a lot like at the school where i worked there was that like towing that line of like the kids want to know who you are um and it always felt strange to have to pretend to have no life (laughs) Um, just like i don't live at this school like there's something that happens after school 
Um, yeah. and, and we really like confronted that and it, it truly did sh reshape relationships in a positive way to get to say like, oh yeah, I have kids. Um, because then they're like, oh, you're not just teacher, you're also mom. And like yeah. you're, you have, and I think that um, with my own mentors, I agree. Like it, there, there's a skill to it, to like knowing if you're crossing a line um, right. versus you're truly just connecting with the people that you work with in a very personal way. Yeah. Um, this conversation has been a lot of fun. I, I love the way that you describe your work. I appreciate how you've brought eating psychology into your work that you coach and counsel. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, I'm curious, is there, are you online? Is if someone wanted to reach out to you or if they had further questions, is there a way that they can get in touch? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my email is peter at austinprofessionalcounseling.com. So obviously you can check out my website with my mentor, John Howard, austinprofessionalcounseling.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, my Instagram is Peter Craig Counseling. Um, I've got some eating psychology stuff on there sometimes. And then I'm on facebook.com slash Peter James Craig. Feel free to reach out there. And I'd love to see you connect. Awesome. Well, thank you, Peter, so much. And thank you, everyone who came live and those of you on the replay. We appreciate it. We'll continue to check comments and we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks, everyone.